All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Sahara Moore, and I am a biology and photography double major here at Oglethorpe University. So today I'm going to be talking to you about a potentially new treatment option for type 2 diabetes. So this treatment involves, it's very non-invasive, it involves static magnetic and electric fields, which are administered from a device while the patient is sleeping. So the particular experiments that I'm going to be sharing with you today were performed on mice, but the researchers just did this experiment in 2020. And so they're moving into large animal trials very soon and then hopefully clinical trials. So if you're anything like me, you're cheering them on and wishing them lots of luck because this could change the lives literally of millions of people around the world because type two diabetes is a very common disease. So there are lots of current treatment options for type two diabetes, but a lot of them have a lot of adverse side effects and they're also very expensive. So what really drew me to this study particularly was um, some personal experience with type two diabetes. Though I don't have the disease myself. I do know a lot of people who do have type two diabetes, kind of runs in my family actually. And um, I helped take care of my grandfather who had type two diabetes and also Alzheimer's disease. And so one of the things that was very difficult about his taking care of him was his diabetes and as his Alzheimer's progressed, he didn't understand what was happening. We, you know, pricked his finger several times a day to take his blood sugar, or we administered insulin shots or medications to him. He didn't understand why he couldn't eat, you know, ice cream like the rest of us were eating, or um, why we were poking him like a pincushion, as you would call it, because he just didn't understand anymore because the Alzheimer's had progressed too far. So that was a really heartbreaking part of his, his treatment. And so when I read this headline that said, hey, we could treat um, type 2 diabetes non-invasively and potentially while the patient is sleeping, it was really intriguing to me because it could not only help the people now that I know with type 2 diabetes, but it could have really been beneficial for my grandfather when I was taking care of him. So though it doesn't matter as much now, um, for him, it could help a lot of other people because there are literally millions of people around the world with type 2 diabetes. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about, because I'm going to be talking about stuff for about 30 minutes, so you're going to be hearing a lot from me. We're going to first talk about what static and magnetic and electric fields are, then what's type 2, type two diabetes and what causes it, then current treatment options, then I'm going to talk you through the um, experiments from this particular study. So the article is called Exposure to Static, Magnetic, and Electric Fields to Treat Type 2 Diabetes, and then how findings can help human patients, and then I'm going to give you a quick review because I know this is a lot of information coming at you in a short amount of time, so I'll just give you a quick review. First up is what are magnetic and electric fields? So we have two magnetic and electric fields hitting us right now as we're sitting here. We have the vertically oriented SE fields, which is our static electric fields, and if you look over at the diagram on the right, you see that it's the vertical field going through the mouse. And then we also have the horizontally oriented SB magnetic fields, which is this one right here that's going horizontally through the mouse. These have been present on Earth from the very beginning of time. All of the species, including humans, have evolved in the presence of magnetic fields. And so it's very crazy because we've had these fields for so long and we know that they're present in the Earth, but we really haven't studied them that much. So they have been used to treat chronic pain as well as conditions such as fibromyalgia, sciatica, and arthritis. But we don't really know the mechanisms too well of how they are treating these diseases. It's been studied some because people believe that they actually have adverse effects on humans. So there's some research that says that, yes, there is an adverse effect to static electric and magnetic fields, but there's also research showing beneficial effects. So it's definitely a study or an area of study that needs to be looked at some more. But the ones that are saying that the treatments are beneficial mainly hypothesize that the electric and magnetic fields are affecting molecules and ions in the body and disrupting bad signals which cause pain. So definitely an area that needs more research, but so far that's what we know. So in talking about type 2 diabetes, I wanted to start with how a healthy body regulates sugar. 
So with a healthy body, you sit here and you eat some food. All food has sugar in it, so for the most part. So when you eat food, your digestive organs, like your stomach, your small intestine, your large intestine, et cetera, they're going to extract the glucose from the food and send it into your bloodstream. Then the blood or the glucose enters your bloodstream and raises your blood glucose levels, which signals your pancreas to start secreting insulin. And then the insulin joins the sugar in your bloodstream and starts bumping up against cells and bumping up into particular spots on the cells, which are insulin receptors. So the insulin receptors are gonna bond with the insulin and that basically acts as a key and opens up a door in the cell to allow sugar to leave the bloodstream and enter the cells. And then the cell is gonna do one of two things with the sugar. One, it may need energy immediately. So it's going to convert the glucose to energy or two, it doesn't need energy right now, so it's going to take the sugar from the bloodstream and store it in the cell until it needs it later. And then as the sugar goes into the cells and out of the bloodstream, it lowers your blood glucose level and signals your pancreas to stop secreting insulin, which is this last step right here. But when you have type 2 diabetes, there's two main issues going on. So like normal, you're eating sugary food or just food in general that has sugar in it, and your digestive organs are pulling out the glucose and um, sending it into your bloodstream, raises your blood glucose level and your pancreas is like, hey, I gotta start secreting insulin. And so it does. But the first problem is, is that your pancreas can't create enough insulin to keep up with all the sugar in your bloodstream. And so the insulin tries to bond with insulin receptors, but this is where we run into our second problem because our insulin receptors and in our cells have become insulin resistant. And so the insulin is trying to connect with the insulin receptors, but it's just bouncing off because the insulin receptor isn't accepting it. And so what happens with the sugar is, is the sugar is trying to leave the body or the bloodstream and go into these cells, but it can't because that door that opens when the insulin bonds with the insulin receptor is just not happening. It's not bonding and so the door isn't opening. And so what consequently happens is that your cells aren't getting the sugar or the glucose that it needs to convert energy, to convert to energy, and so that blood sugar, the sugar in your blood is not getting put into the cells. And so your blood sugar still stays elevated and your pancreas is continually trying to create more and more insulin. But the problem is, is that it can't keep up because the cells are becoming more and more insulin resistant. So the pancreas is having to create more and more insulin and your blood sugar levels are staying high for longer. And so this causes a lot of issues in your body, but the main two that we're really concerned about is that blood vessels start to break down in the presence of high amounts of sugar in the bloodstream for a long time. So if you have high blood sugar for a really long time, it's gonna break down your blood cells and you need your blood cells to do things like carry oxygen around your body. They're very, very important. And then the second problem is, is that if sugar is not getting into the cells, that's the cell's energy source. So what do the cells start to do when they don't have any energy? Well, they start breaking down fat in your body. But you may be thinking, hey, breaking down fat, I'm getting skinnier. No. What's happening is, is that when your body starts breaking down fat, it starts releasing ketones into your bloodstream. And ketones, though they do get filtered out to a degree, it takes a while. And so they start building up into your body and they cause a lot of really dangerous issues, um, which is why we really don't want that in the body either, because it can be extremely dangerous. So as a recap, your digestive organs extract the glucose, your pancreas starts secreting insulin, your blood sugar levels increase due to insulin resistance, and the organs and muscles, which are going to be your liver and your muscle tissues, is what's taking up those, uh, taking up the sugar in your bloodstream, are no longer responding to insulin and ingest this glucose. So your blood sugar stays high. So there are a lot of current type 2 diabetes treatment options. They do all have lots of adverse side effects, unfortunately. But there's three main categories. There's a category that increases insulin sensitivity, a category that stimulates your body to produce more insulin, and then a third category, which provides usable insulin to your body to give your pancreas a bit of a break, or at least some assistance in processing that sugar that you're consuming. So in the category that increases your insulin sensitivity, you have metformin and thiazol donuts. So metformin works with your body to keep your liver from producing as much glucose. So your liver is producing glucose to help provide energy for your cells, or the sugar that your cells need for energy. 
But what metformin does is it blocks the deliver from creating that glucose, increasing the need for the glucose that you're getting from your diet. And then it also raises insulin sensitivity in your cells and tissues. So it's making those insulin receptors more receptive to the insulin that's trying to bond with them. And then the second drug in that category is thiazoldonus. And those only, that category of drug only increases insulin sensitivity in the body. So it doesn't do anything with the liver like metformin does. The next category stimulates your body to produce more insulin. So sulfonylureas are going to stimulate your body to produce insulin and kind of a more long-term effect than glionides. Glionides are a more temporary effect. So this would be an example of when you would take a glionide would be if, for instance, you have problems when you eat. So maybe your blood sugar is fine normally, but when you eat something really sugary, then your body can't produce enough insulin, your pancreas can't produce enough insulin, and you need some help. So then you would take a glionide, it would work for a couple hours till all that blood sugar has decreased, and then you'd be fine. But then sulfonylureas are for patients who have more severe type 2 diabetes, and they need more constant blood sugar regulation and more um, insulin in their body kind of at all times. And then the final category is insulin. So insulin can be administered in one of two ways. You can give yourself an insulin shot. It's usually administered in the stomach. Or you can have an insulin pump, which is connected to your stomach as well, which constantly takes your blood sugar and administers um, insulin to keep your body at a regular healthy glucose level. So short-acting insulin kind of acts like a glyna. It's going to provide a burst of insulin to your body to help your pancreas process or help your pancreas produce insulin to process the sugar in your bloodstream. But long acting insulin is going to act more like a sulfonylurea in that it is a more of an overnight or full day treatment. It's going to regu help regulate your blood sugar levels throughout the day. All right, this is the fun stuff. So, for this study, you've now learned about static magnetic and electric fields, type 2 diabetes, and current treatment options. So now we can start talking about the actual experiments. This experiment, like I mentioned earlier, has two main authors and then also some professors. And it came from some pretty unexpected origins, actually, which I think some of the best experiments do. The two main authors, Calvin Carter and Sunny Hong, are MD PhD students at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. And they still are. They were when they first started this article and these experiments, and they actually still are there. And to me, this was pretty inspirational because even though they had a lot of help from professors, this is a pretty groundbreaking study um, and can change a lot of lives. So I think it's pretty amazing that they are able to do this at such an early stage in their medical training. So Sunny Hong was a first year medical student and she needed to practice taking blood from mice. So her friend Calvin, was, who's the co-author of the article, was doing a study on how static and magnetic electric fields, very high levels of them, was affecting the brain of mice. And so like any good friend, he was like, Sunny, you can borrow my mice and you can take their blood sugar. But I'm gonna warn you that they are type two diabetic and I'm not treating their disease, so it's gonna be high. So we've just been forewarned. But what she found when she started taking their blood is that actually their blood sugar levels were fine. So she was really perplexed. So she went back to Calvin and she's like, are you sure you didn't treat them today? Because they've got normal blood sugar and that shouldn't be the case if they're type two diabetic. He was like, no, I haven't been treating them. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe you should take their blood again. Maybe you're doing it wrong. So she continued to take their blood sugar for several days, about a week actually. And she was consistently finding that their blood sugar levels were within normal range. And so she was like, this is really strange. So her and Calvin put together a proposal for their professors. And so they pitched them this ex these experiments that we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes. And that's what happened. So this experiment was started. So the first experiment that they did was to just kind of test this theory that they had been seeing, right? They've been seeing consistently that the blood sugar of the mice was, was normal. So like, is this because of these oh, static magnetic electric fields? So they wanted to test and see if that was truly the case. 
So my hypothesis of experiment one was exposing type two diabetic mice to continuous static and magnetic and electric fields would lower their fasting blood glucose levels and improve glucose tolerance. So they got a couple of different diabetic mouse models. They had the DBDB, leptin, re leptin receptor deficient model, which was basically just missing a receptor and the mice that allowed them to process blood sugar or process sugar in the bloodstream. Then they had the high fat diet mouse or the 60% high fat diet dietary model mouse, which best represents humans who have eaten a unhealthy diet and then developed type two diabetes. And then the third was the BBS mouse or the obese diabetic mouse model of the paleotropic human disorder of Bardet Feldi, which is a mouthful. So anything that you see going forward with BBS, that is the obese diabetic mouse model. <laughs> so what these researchers did was they took the mice and they put them in non-metallic cages to prevent interference with the magnetic and electric fields. And they housed them in there and exposed them continuously to static, magnetic, and electric fields for 30 days. So you can see they were exposed to the SE field and the SB field, or the static electric and static magnetic fields, for 30 days continuously. And these fields were 100 times stronger than the ones that were exposed to on Earth. And then they performed pre- and post-treatment fasting blood glucose levels and glucose tolerance tests. So fasting just means they didn't eat for about six hours before the test. And then they just took the mice's blood sugar and tested to see how high or low it was. And what they discovered, we can see here in this graph on the right. So WTs are wild type mice and BBS is the obese diabetic mouse model. And then FBG over here, that's fasting blood glucose levels. So the control group is our blue and the, S, or the red group is the treatment group. And we see that with the wild type mice or the non-diabetic mice, there's a bit of a difference between the control group and the treatment group, but it's not statistically significant. So we're not going to worry about that. But what we do see a pretty dramatic difference in is the BBS group. So in the control group, their fasting blood glucose level was closer to 120. It's probably about like 110-ish. And then with the treatment, it dropped it pretty dramatically, almost halfway. Um, it goes from about 120 to about 70. So in words, because that's kind of just a big figure. Combined SBE exposure reduced fasting blood sugar by 43% in the BBS mice, which we can see it's almost half, and 33% in the high fat diet and DBDB leptin receptor deficient mice. And then glucose intolerance was completely reversed in the high fat diet and DVDB models. So a glucose tolerance test is where they feed the mice sugar and then they see how the body responds. And they discovered that it responded just like a normal person would respond with that high level of sugar that they were feeding the mice. And then no significant changes occurred in the blood sugar levels of the chow fed diet mice or the control group, which we see here in the figure as well. So after they did this first study, they were like, okay, we see that combining the S and B fields, or the S and E fields, obviously is helping the mice, but do we really need both of them or is one of the fields doing all the work? So they hypothesized that exposing mice to only S, B, or S, E fields would have no effect on their fasting blood glucose levels and glucose tolerance. So they took some high fat diet mice and they split them up into three groups. Group one was exposed to only the static, horizontally oriented, SB fields or magnetic fields. Then group two was exposed only to the vertically oriented SE static electric field. And then the third group, which is kind of our control group, was exposed to the SE and SB fields at the same time because they knew that already had a positive effect on the mice. They exposed them to fields that were 100 times stronger than those on Earth for 30 days continuously 24 seven. And they did blood glucose tolerance tests and a fasting blood glucose level. So again, they didn't let the mice eat for six hours and they took their blood sugar levels. And they also then fed them sugar and saw how their body was processing that sugar. And if we look over at the figure on the right, we see, this is a bit of a confusing figure, so I apologize for that. But on the y-axis, we have the glucose levels of the mice and also time. So NCD is our normal chow-fed diet mice and NCD plus SVE is the treatment group. 
And so we see that starting at the beginning, blood sugar peaks at about 300, and then as time goes on, it starts to decrease. But then with the treatment, we see that the normal child-fed diet mice really have no difference pre and post treatment as far as their blood glucose levels go. So it kind of follows that same line all the way down. But where we do start to see a difference is with the high fat diet mice. So the blue is our control group that didn't receive any treatment. And so as time goes on, it does decrease a bit. Their blood sugar level goes down some, but not that much. But when we look at the treatment group, it's very much lower after the treatment. So it starts here at about 100 instead of about 200 in this um, non-treated group. And it peaks at about 300 instead of almost 400 and then continues to drop all the way down to about 150-ish as time goes on. So we can see that obviously there was an effect on the treatment of lowering the blood glucose levels in the high-fat diet mice. So exposure to only SB fields significantly worsened glycemia and glucose tolerance in all of the mice that were treated. So instead of it actually having a good effect, it was having an adverse effect. Then exposure to only SE fields had no effect on any of the mice. And then only exposure to combined SBE fields or the static and magnetic electric fields significantly improved glucose tolerance and glycemia in the mice. So, the researchers now discovered that yes, we can lower their blood glucose levels and reverse glucose intolerance by exposing these mice to combined SBE fields continuously. And we know that we have to use both because if we just use one, we know that we're not gonna get the same results. So then they were curious, okay, why is this working? So there's two different mechanisms that could be happening here. One, we could be raising, the treatment could be raising the insulin levels in the body. It could work like a glinide or a sulfonylurea and cause the body to secrete more insulin. Or the second mechanism being that it was raising insulin sensitivity and working like a metformin or a thiazidone. So this first experiment or experiment three is testing to see if it's the treatment was increasing the blood glucose levels of the mice. So they hypothesized the SP exposure would lower fasting blood glucose or blood glucose levels by increasing insulin sensitivity in the body or increasing insulin levels in the body. I apologize. So for the methods, they took high fat diet mice and DVDV leptin receptor deficient mice and they exposed them continuously for 30 days to SBE. And those fields are once again, 100 times stronger than the ones found on earth. Then they took plasma insulin level tests following a 16 hour fast. So in theory, if this was the correct mechanism, what we would find is that they would have a higher insulin level post-treatment or plasma insulin level post-treatment than pre-treatment, because what would be happening is that the body would be producing more and more insulin even when food isn't being consumed. But what they actually found was the opposite. So no increase in plasma insulin levels were observed in any animal exposed to SPE. And in the high fat diet mice, which we can see over here in the figure, there was actually a 43% lower level of plasma insulin in the body. So what this suggests is, that instead of working to stimulate the body to produce more insulin, what it's doing, this treatment from the static magnetic and electric fields, it's actually making the body's tissues more sensitive to insulin. So if you look over at the graph, we can see, just as I was saying, that um, in our control group, there's no change in the insulin levels in the normal child-fed diet mice, pre or post-treatment. There's really no change in the DBDB leptin receptor deficient models. It's not, there's a slight change, but it's not statistically significant. But in the high fat diet mice, we do see that there is a statistically significant decrease in insulin levels post-treatment versus pre-treatment because blue is our control group, for no treatment, and red is our um, treatment group, which is exposed to the SB. So this brings us to our fourth and final experiment, which wanted to test if it was really working by increasing insulin sensitivity in the body of the mice. So they hypothesize a combined SBE treatment or static magnetic and electric field treatment lowers blood sugar and reverses glucose intolerance by increasing the body's insulin sensitivity. 
And so the methods for this one's a bit more confusing, but stick with me for a minute. So the normal child-fed diet mice and high-fat diet mice were exposed to SBE for up to 30 hours a day for seven hours a day. So in a previous experiment that I didn't get to present to you guys just because of time, they did discover that it only took seven hours a day of the treatment to see the same helpful effects. And then they only exposed them for up to 30 days in this particular experiment because they wanted to see how long do we have to expose these, expose these mice to SBE before we start seeing these positive effects. We know we only have to do seven hours a day. What's the, how many days does it take before the treatment starts working? And then they performed pre and post treatment hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps after a six hour fast. So I'm sure you're like, what are you talking about? So I'm gonna direct your attention over to the right to this diagram. So what the researchers did when they put these hyperinsulinemic glycemic clamps into the mice is they first threaded a catheter into the carotid artery of the mouse and also into the jugular vein. They attached it to this device, which was connected to an insulin infusion pump and a glucose infusion pump. And then they also have the syringe up here because they can take blood samples, test their blood sugars and other, do other tests while the treatment is going on because it's a bit difficult when the mouse is moving around and that kind of thing. So in this particular experiment, there's two ways that you can use these hyperinsulinemic glycemic clamps. You can either infuse the mice with a steady rate of glucose and see how much insulin you have to administer to keep their blood sugar within normal range, or you can infuse them with a steady rate of insulin and then see how much glucose you have to infuse the mouse with to um, maintain a steady blood sugar that's in a normal range. So what they did for this particular study is they fed, or they, they infused the mice with a steady rate of insulin and then saw how much glucose they had to uh, administer to keep the mice's blood sugar within a normal range. And what they discovered was that 30-day exposed normal child-fed diet or control mice required a 17% increase in glucose infusion rates. 30-day exposed high-fat diet mice required a 106% increase in glucose infusion rates when compared to pretreatment results. And then SBE exposure enhanced insulin-stimulated insulin glucose disposal by 14% in normal child-fed diet mice and 62% in high-fat diet mice in all tissue types measured. And they discovered also that results, these positive results were seen in as little as three days of exposure at seven hours a day. So I know that was a lot all at once, but what it means is that we were correct, the researchers were correct, and that it was increasing insulin sensitivity in the body. And there's, like I mentioned before, your muscles and your liver take up glucose, or take up the cells. The cells in your muscles and liver take up the glucose that's in your bloodstream. So what this third bullet means, where this um, insulin-stimulated glucose disposal was increased, that means that those insulin receptors are accepting the insulin and allowing more sugar to get into the cells at a higher rate. So 14% higher in a normal non-diabetic mouse and 62% higher in diabetic mice. And so the first two bullets, 30-day exposed NCD mice required a 17% increase in glucose and 30-day high-fat diet required 106% increase in glucose infusion rates. That means that as they were giving the mice a steady stream of insulin, they were requiring more sugar because their body was more insulin sensitive and processing the insulin or processing the sugar faster. They needed more and more sugar to be infused in them to keep their blood sugar from going dangerously low. And then obviously, last bullet, you only have to expose the mice for three days to start seeing these positive results and only for seven hours a day, which is, can be administered while they're sleeping. So how can, this, how can these findings help human patients? Well, first of all, this is an overnight treatment. They're exposing the mice while they're sleeping. So instead of people having to constantly do check, check their blood sugars, um, do insulin shots several times a day, or take pills several times a day, this can be an overnight treatment that people do while they're sleeping. They also, if we're, because we determined that this treatment is working because of increased insulin sensitivity, People can eat less restricted diets. I mean, there was a huge list of foods that my grandfather couldn't eat. And, you know, if his insulin sensitivity was, or insulin resistance was fixed and he had higher insulin sensitivity, he could eat in those things. So that would be really exciting for type 2 diabetes patients. 
Also, this is a non-invasive treatment. The other treatment options are very invasive and they've got some nasty side effects. You know, you're taking pills, you're shooting your, you know, you're giving yourself a shot. So this is a non-invasive treatment that doesn't require you to consume anything that gives you nasty side effects or you don't have to poke yourself in needles every day. It's also potentially more cost effective because with the treatment options that are out there right now, you're having to buy pills and take them every day, several times a day, or get insulin, which you're having to administer several times a day. This is a treatment that can be administered through a device. So yes, a device might break, but it could potentially be a lot more cost-effective for patients instead of having to purchase pills and medicine you know, every month. This is a treatment that you might even be able to have for your entire life. They also discovered no adverse side effects so far. So it's a lot better than the current treatment options that are out there. And then, like I said earlier in the presentation, they are moving into large animal trials and clinical trials. So hopefully it'll work out. So this can help millions of people around the world. So the main takeaways, because I know I've been talking for quite a while, is that researchers have found a potentially non-invasive way to treat patients in as little as seven hours a day. And treatment requires a combined static and electric field to be used together to lower fasting blood glucose levels and reverse glucose intolerance through increasing insulin sensitivity in the body. And that is all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for sticking around. I know this was a long presentation and I hope you guys have an awesome day.